to tame me You can't catch me on the run Cause I'm gone, yeah I blaze trail, set fire to what's behind me No, I'm never looking back I'm on the run I could only ever be what I'm made to be Feels good when I'm living on the edge Watch me now I'm gonna say good ground Can't stop me now I don't give up And I won't back down I'm a force of nature Can't be contained I got a lightning running all through my veins Watch me now Watch me Over West Virginia. When I'm back home, you'll find me at my local Parmar store. We have that gold and blue pride at your local Parmar store. We are coming to your neighborhood soon. West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. We have you covered. Download the Parmar app and sign up for the Parmar Rewards Card. Food, gas, groceries, and more. We are gold and blue proud, and we are Parmar stores. If there's not a Parmar store near you now, there will be soon. Northern Eagle Distributing, proudly serving Anheuser-Busch products to West Virginia. On September 2nd, for the WVU versus Penn State football game, the Wolfman's Call is going to be going live for a pregame at the Pallet Bar in Scott Depot, West Virginia. There will be three ways to watch this. One in person at the Pallet Bar starting at 5 o'clock, and the broadcast will go at 6 or you can watch it from the Wolfman's Call Network at one of the fine establishments. Or also you can watch it at the Voice of College Football. That's West Virginia's Voice of College Football. If your place, your favorite place, doesn't have it and you want to watch it, tell that proprietor. Go ahead and sign up for the Wolfman's Call Network at wolfmanscall at gmail.com. Again, that's wolfmanscall at gmail.com or at West Virginia. V-O-C-F-B. You're not going to want to miss the action, and it's all coming to you from the Wolfman's Call. Bill Breakdown, baby! September 2nd, starting at 6 o'clock. Get signed up. Boom! for that they call it happy valley for themselves but it's not so happy for opponents entering in there beaver stadium yes i've played there a couple times and yes it's been difficult but it's a great challenge great opportunity if you want to be the man you got to beat the man and this year it's looking like penn state university football is at the top of the list you know one of them right now who knows what's going to happen to the season but it's a wild, wild Wednesday, and thank you for coming into the Wolfman's Call. I'm Wolfman Dale Wolfley. Most of y'all know me, and we got something really special today. Hey, we have Coach Jay Paterno coming in here. 17 years coaching, 12 years as quarterback coach at Penn State. 17 with Penn State, 12 years as a quarterback coach. Yes, he coached with his father, Joe Paterno, the great one. And, of course, he is also. Also, I gotta tell you this before I bring him on here. I got this special thing up here, and I wanted to add this in uh, right here so you can all see. And check this out now. This is very cool. Okay, right there we see it. You got you got Coach Jay, Coach Joe, right off their paternal big time. We got to get that again. And then you have him right there, Nittany Game Week. He's a co-host. with you see the scrapper, man? Coach Tom Bradley scrap, and of course, did you see over there? You see it footballs in a pot and some cooking materials. That's his 
go ahead is uh, ESPN Radio 970 show the co-host. It's called Pig Skin Stew. He's also an author of many books, articles. Check out his website, and it's just amazing. But without further delay, let's go ahead and bring him on here now. What's up there, Coach Jay Paterno? Coach, how are you? Doing great, Wolfman. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Doing we're well. Actually getting ready to do some TV stuff, so it's a little chaotic, but we're going to make this happen. All right. Very good, man. Well, I'm so excited about this, and you can see that, and I'm excited the fact that we start the Pigskin Stew radio show uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, yep. and uh, what's up online for the first? What are you going to do for the first week? Well, we got uh, Oliver Luck as our guest uh, for uh, for tomorrow. He's going to talk some West Virginia stuff. Obviously, he has a pretty good had a pretty good career there, uh, both as a player as an athletic director. We got uh, you coming on to talk about West Virginia. We got Mike Porman coming on to talk about Penn State, and then uh, Tom Bradley, who you mentioned already. He and I are going to be uh, not only do we pick and stew on ESPN Radio, we also do Nittany Game Week, which is on WTOV in Wheeling. It's on Fox in Pittsburgh, uh, which gets it covers a good number of part of the state. And it also covers uh, uh, we have a station out of Youngstown that gets into part of part of West Virginia. So we're, West Virginia fans can even watch and see what we talk about. Yeah, from what I'm told, 34 million uh, TV sets. Pretty yep. impressive there. Yep. No doubt yep. about it. And let's just get it real quick as Coach Tom uh, is, you know, he coached it. Penn State for all those years. We all know that. But he also coached at WVU. And yep. he's going to be doing the coin toss. Uh, I think besides your father, he is second in games coached at Penn State for all time uh, for numbers. That's pretty special. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a real good a good moment for Tom. And, and you know, for our fan base that loves the tradition of the place, a guy like Tom coming out and doing the coin toss, um, you know, we're putting a lot of pressure on to make sure he gets the coin toss right. <laughs> um, and, and the real pressure is that the official makes sure they get the coin back because uh, Tom's been known to Tom. Tom still has his first communion money. <laughs> All right, excellent. Yeah, you know what? That is really funny, and I can't wait to do the pigskin stew the whole season uh, with you guys. Uh, tough game for the Mountaineers to start out with, that's for sure. Though uh, coming in and opening up there with Penn State, so what? How tough is it? You saw the intro there. You saw the noise. Michigan, how tough is it? Well, t- I'm not going to tell you. How, I'm not going to tell you how tough I think it is. I can tell you. Urban Meyer has told me a number of times when when it's going at night, it's louder than LSU at night, and that's saying something. And it really is. Uh, our fan base is wired in. Um, they understand they can have an impact on the game. They like to have an impact on a game. Um, they'll they'll you know if there's an offside penalty or false start, place goes nuts. It only adds to it. Um, and I think a lot of people come here the first time and they think, well, we practice with noise, but until you're in it, it is a whole different level. Yeah, it is quite a challenge for the Mountaineers to come in uh, first game and deal with that noise. And I will tell you, I played at Penn State. I've been to LSU for a night game, and I think Urban Meyer's right. I definitely yeah. I definitely agree with him. So, okay, so let's get into it. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty, and we'll start off with offense. And if you could, you know, we talked a couple months ago, but, you know, Drew Alarm, like he was the man. Is he the man now? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's the worst-kept secret in town. You know, they keep people who say it's an open – I mean, they're, Penn State put them – if you get your tickets for the game, Alar's picture's on the ticket for the first game. So somebody <laughs> made that decision a while ago to put him on there. Um, uh, he's, he's not as mobile as what Penn State's had. Um, so that's going to be a little bit different. Um, West Virginia will kind of know where he's going to set up to throw the ball downfield, um, which I think helps. But Penn State's got a veteran offensive line. Um, and I think the big the big thing will be how will Penn State's wideouts, if West Virginia comes up and challenges Penn State's wideouts, I don't know if there's a proven guy there yet. They've had a cut the transfer in from Kent, Kent State. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now. But that the wideout core is going to be – a challenge. Theo Johnson, a tight end, is a matchup problem for people in the pass game. Uh, and they've done a good job getting the running backs involved in the pass game. So I think Allah will have the people around him uh, in terms of we know what he's got with the running backs and tight ends in the pass game. The question is going to be the wideouts. And I think as I've looked at West Virginia getting ready for our TV show and even for tomorrow, um, you know, they've got some skill guys that, that can cover people. I mean, they've got athletes. The question is, are they going to be good enough? And we'll see how they match up. You know, I was watching, speaking of Urban Meyer, but I was watching the Ohio State-Penn State game last year, 
And three and a half quarters, it was a game, and it was anybody's yep. game until craziness happened. And then all of a sudden, you know, four touchdowns in six minutes. It, it was totally unexpected. But I'm watching that. I'm like, oh, all these guys are back. Or most of them, the majority of these guys are back. Obviously, uh, Alar is going to be the first one. And I'm looking at the defense right now, especially. I'm saying, wow, these players are tough, physical. And you got to start with what? Corner Kalen King, right? Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at Penn State, they've got they've got really, really good talent at, on all three levels on defense. You've got two really good pass rushers. Now, the question is, you know, looking at West Virginia's offensive line, it's very experienced. Um, you know, I, from them, I'm running, middle, you know, Zach Frazier is a heck of a player at center for, I think that's the name, Zach Frazier for West yes. Virginia. Um, I think having a running quarterback, if it is Garrett Green, um, you know, I think he gives them a little different element um, in terms of the run game that they didn't have last year with JT Daniels. Um, but I think as you look at Penn State, they've got two really good pass rushers. Uh, Abdul Carter, at linebacker, is a really talented guy, and King in the secondary. So they've got guys at all three levels. That are that are going to be, you know, you would take any team in the country would take those guys. The question is going to be, how do they hold up on the inside running, not just for West Virginia but for the rest of the season, uh, and how will you know how will the other two linebackers play, and how will the rest of the secondary play? They're experienced, but the question is going to be, you know, how how many games can they win? But I, I think you know if West Virginia comes in and takes care of the football, and we're able to establish a run game, um, then I think it could be it could be this thing could be a fourth quarter game and be very interesting. Uh, but but turnovers, they cannot give Penn State a short field at all. Mm-hmm. And I know last year, they, and I think defensively, they're going to have to get a couple of turnovers, which I know was a problem for them last year. Yeah, it, it was. And, and when I look at that offensive line, I, I have to look at the left tackle. I can't even pronounce his name. but Olu Fashionu. Okay, thank you so yeah. much, Fashionu. And, you know, they say he could have been a first-rounder this year coming out, and he decided to stay. Why did he stay? Well, I don't. I haven't asked him, but but I know he graduated high school early, so he's young. I think he's nine. He was only nineteen. Might be twenty now, um, but his parents are really really smart people. Mm-hmm. He's a really really good student. And I think they looked at it and said, you know, probably another year in college would be good. I can get my degree, um, and you know, a nineteen or twenty year old going to the NFL and all of a sudden facing somebody named Bosa, I mean, or T.J. Watt or you know, Vaughn Miller when he's healthy. I mean, that's a whole different when you're playing those 27, 28 year old pass rushers and you're 20, that's a different world. It's probably, I think it was really, really a smart decision. And certainly the money and the money will still be there next year. Yeah. Well, no, but, no doubt about it. I was thinking that maybe he was looking for something special this year, maybe uh, also in the team frame, because yeah. it seems like everybody's like pointing. If you're going to get by your Michigans, if you're going to get by your Ohio States, it, there seems like they're pointing to this season. Yeah, I think those – look, I think those are the two games everybody's got circled. I think there's three swing games, three or four swing games for Penn State. I think West Virginia, you know, is a, is a game that if you don't come in there and play really, really well. I mean, they you know, they beat Oklahoma last year. Uh, they beat Oklahoma State last year. It's a team that, 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 that over the last couple of years has beaten some ranked teams. Um, this is not a – you know, this is not a – you know, we're not opening with the Little Sisters of Poor. West Virginia is a game they got to be ready for. But you got Ohio State and Michigan. Those are going to determine where you are in the Big Ten pecking order. But Illinois, we, play, we go out to Illinois, and they're really they, – they're better than people think. Mm. we got Iowa coming in. And then Maryland, you know, with the quarterback back. So, you know, there's a couple of challenges there. So, you know, there are games that, you know, as a coach, if I'm looking at it, I'd say, you know, there's, there's four or five games there that if we don't play well, we can lose any one of them. Um, and if we play really well, we can win all of them. So I think that's going to be the, those are going to be the kind of things that determine what kind of season Penn State has. Yeah. You know, Jay, I look at this and I'm, I'm looking at, oh, your three running backs over 800 yep. years. Kate Allen, uh, he had 861. You had Nicholas Singleton. Is he the best running back, by the way, in the right now in the Big Ten or maybe in the country? Singleton? Yeah. I'm, I know I'm, I may be speaking at, you know, I'm not sure he's the best running back at Penn State. If if I'm if I'm an NFL executive and I'm looking and saying, because uh, because Allen has you know the one thing I would tell people Allen has really got a couple things in the pass game that he's really special at. Yeah, uh, that he might be a little better than Singleton. Singleton's more of your power guy with some speed with a lot of speed, obviously. And Allen is the guy that's a little bit more shifty, <laughs> but able to make some other things happen in the pass game. So 
uh, either one of them you can't go wrong with. Um, either, both of them are great players. Um, you know, I, you know, I, and whether we'll see them in there at the same time, I think you will, um, which, again, is defense coordinator. That's not what you want to see. But I think that also being able to run the ball, I know West Virginia had trouble stopping the ball, so I, I would anticipate Penn State comes out, tries to establish the run game, uh, give their quarterback some some uh, throws to get them in a rhythm, but lean on that run game early until everything kind of settles down. Are you concerned about Alar Vegas' first start? Uh, although he's played in ten games last yeah. season, you know he's got plenty of reps, quality reps, but it's still his first start. Well, you know, I had a friend of mine that raised hunting dogs for a long time. And he said, you know, the genetics, he said, you can get the best litter and genetically or whatever, but until you go out and shoot the gun and see if they chase the rabbit, uh, you don't know what you got. He said, some of those dogs, when you shoot the gun, they go hide behind your leg because they don't, they don't like, you know, they're not, they don't, they're not used to that and they react negatively to it. So I think until you go out there and see what they do when the game is on the line, when all of a sudden it's on you. Um, that's when you find out what you got. And really, you really don't know what you have at a quarterback until you're behind. Two guys had a tough couple, maybe a tough quarter or two, and then all of a sudden he, he, he just overcomes it and leads the team back. I mean, that's when you know what you got. Yeah, you know, I, I'm looking at your running, obviously. You know, you even have, was it Trey Potts, who's another over 800-yard rusher. So you have the running backs. But you also have the, you mentioned before with Theo Johnson and the tight ends, but you also have uh, Tyler Warren. Now, you go 12 personnel, yep. that creates real problems when you have two, really one outstanding tight end, I guess, right now, and, and the yep. one other is pretty darn really good. Uh, yep. And you add that onto a tackles and an offensive line is that they're saying is the best. So what kind of problem is that going to pose, do you think, in, in the strategy against West Virginia? Well, I think, you know, when you look at West Virginia's system, when they've got three down guys in their system and they're really kind of playing a, almost like a hybrid nickel most of the game because it's a 3-3 with five DBs or a big, you know, you want to call what they got a big linebacker. They're, they're a little going to be a little undersized for what Penn State presents to them. Um, yeah. But, you know, but they're more multiple and they're in the things they can do. They're going to have to do some things up front, stunning and twisting. But I – I respect, you know, and I know when I was coaching playing that same scheme, we want to try and establish the run first. And then, you know, but, you know, if West Virginia can come down and say, okay, we're going to go one-on-one -on -one with your wideouts and put a number of guys around the ball, then the numbers start to work out and it becomes how they tackle um, the tackle the running back. So I think it's going to be, you know, that's going to be the chess match. It's going to be, can West Virginia hold up up front? Is Penn, if Penn State goes to 12 personnel with two tight ends, what's their move? Um and, you know, if they make the move to put more people around, can they handle the stuff one-on-one -on -one outside? Okay. And I know you touched a little bit on the wide receivers, but let's just uh, – DeAndre Lambert-Smith, leading receiver, returning producer, number one, looked really good in Ohio State game. I mean, he looks like a number one receiver. What's about him? Everybody's kind of waiting for him to really be dominant. I think, I think that's, that's the real question. Is he going to be able to take over a game – and, and be dominant and force you to change your coverage. I mean, if you look at Marvin Harrison, Ohio State, you, as a defense coordinator, right off the bat, you know he needs he, – somebody needs help to cover him. And if, if, if Keandre can do that, then I think that changes the game for Penn State. But no one has really seen that just yet. We're hoping that he does. Um, I know you're hoping it doesn't happen on Saturday night, but we'll see. Well, uh, there's no doubt about it. And I, I think, too, is that to protect your, your first guy, it's good to have an offensive line and two tight ends and be able to go ahead and try to establish that because you guys did it last year. And that's why you already okay. done it. It's not like it's a secret. You can yep. do it because you can do it again. All right. So let's get into uh, Manny Diaz. He's kind of a gambler. Now, I had Coach uh, Scrap on here. And he was like, you know, well, you got four defensive linemen that can put pressure on the ball. So you don't always have to blitz. But he likes to gamble. He likes to blitz. Yep. Uh, well, what do you see? Oh, I think he definitely likes to go after it. And he likes to he likes to do some things. Um, I think one of the things that happens sometimes with defense coordinators, they get the reputation as the blitz guy. Um, and sometimes if you just got better personnel, you can just rush four and get there. Um, and I think any, every defense court will tell you, if I can get there with four, I'm going to get there with four. Um, and I think that's really where it comes from. And with the, the outside guys they got, I don't know that, I don't know they'll have to blitz a lot. 
Um, now, obviously, rundowns, there's a lot of, there's some run pressures that you like, but when it's third down, and if, if West Virginia's in a lot of third and long, it's going to be a problem for them, and I think they won't, Penn State may not need to blitz. Um, yeah. right. but, but we'll see. But I think, you know, you know the other question mark is about Penn State's wide receivers. I know West Virginia's got some wide, you know, they're, they're a whole new wide receiver core. I know they got the two freshmen everybody likes. They got the kid from NC State. Um, Carter, I think, is his name off the top of my head. Um, I think that's going to be interesting to see how they match up with Penn State secondary because, you know, Manny Diaz has not been a guy that puts his best corner on your best wide out all the time. Okay. So, you know, do they do they get West, you know, the other corner is good, but not at King's level. So if you're going to throw it one, you're going to throw the opposite at Dixon, uh, Penn State's corner. Um, so I'll be curious to see how they West Virginia tries to attack that. Those are the kind of things I'll be watching for Saturday night. Being that this is uh, Manny Diaz's second year at Penn State, last year, did you go against any running quarterbacks as you could think of and remember the game plan that he used? What do you think that we could expect from Manny Diaz going with a Garrett Green who can run the ball? Well, I think one of the things that happens when you get the running quarterback, if he's a guy that can really hurt you, it gets you out of, it gets you out of some of your man-to-man schemes. Because, you know, as if, you know, when you're in man-to-man, if you don't spy the quarterback and he gets loose, you've got problems. So, he, you know, they've been a little bit more zone when they get to with the running quarterbacks, but they'll take their chances. But I would, I would anticipate they're going to go out there, and, and I think what they'll do is they'll lean on their corners and see if West Virginia can beat them and keep a, you know, put another secondary guy around the ball to take care of the quarterback run game because that's the best way to take care of it is bring another guy down who's responsible for the quarterback. So I think I would anticipate them to do that on Saturday night and uh, see if they can hold up outside. And if they can hold up outside, they'll probably play most of the game that way. Yeah, I think that – what do you just expect that they're just going to try to really stop the run, put the put the numbers there, lead the corners on the island like you just said about the outside guy? Because you got Ronnie Dixon, obviously we talked about Kalen King. Uh, is that what you have to do to try to just make sure that West Virginia does not get going? Yeah, I, I think what you want to try – what I want to try and find out is, you know, if I'm looking at playing West Virginia, I'm looking at and saying, okay, let's see if we can – make this a game where we, we control the ball, you know, and, and you know, the other, the other thing too is with the new clock rules uh, with the clock running, um, you know, during the game, you know, when you move the chains, that benefits teams that want to run the ball and control the tempo. Um, and I think in week zero, people started to realize that, you know, that opening drive, if you got teams that's running the ball and they take the opening drive, um, you might not see the field till there's eight minutes to go in the first quarter because, the clock runs so much more now than it does that it did last year. So we'll, you know, we'll see how that goes, but I, if I'm Penn State, I'm going to try and make this a game in the trenches. Cause I feel like I've got an advantage there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Last question for you. And I'll let you get going to your TV stuff. All yep. right. How do you win at Penn State? What do you think has to happen for teams? Cause you don't lose very often at Penn State. No. What has to happen in your, in your history, all the years you've seen it and a lot of victories. What is it? opposing teams have to do to overcome all the challenges and beat a really good Penn State team? Well, first off, right off the bat, you cannot turn the ball over. That That is number one. You, you've got to win the turnover margin at Penn State to win. You've got to be able to run the ball, and you've got to be able to get – you've got to get into the game early and get get run the ball, get a score early, and get the crowd a little bit settled down because the, it, the crowd – when at a night game, they come out, they're juiced, they're excited – and if you, if you come out and start, you know, Nebraska came in here in 2002 and the first series of the game, they're trying to check at the line of scrimmage. They can't hear it. They call timeout. That just encourages the crowd. So come out and know what you're doing right off the bat. Um, be precise. Don't turn the ball over. And I think, you got, you know, then if you do those things and you can pick up a turnover here and there, then you got a chance. And I think that's, that's true with any team, whether it's West Virginia, whether it's Ohio State, doesn't matter. I mean, it's tough to come in there, turn the ball over, and win the game. Yep, that's for sure. All right, Coach Jay Paterno, man, we thank you so much. It's going to be a great season on Pigskin Stew. Uh, I get my little, uh, my time there, my blitz uh, that I get to do on your show, so I'm fired up. I'm ready. Just wait, I'm going to give you my prediction tomorrow, by the way. Uh, yes. I'll do it on the show. Oh, have I got a question for you tomorrow? You'll see. We got a good <laughs> one for you. All right, very good. All right, well, hey, Coach, thank you, man, and we'll see you tomorrow and uh, the rest of the season. We'll get rocking. All right, man, take care. Thanks. Appreciate your time. And all right. Well, hey, Joe, or excuse me, Jay Paternal. 
the son of Coach Joe Paterno. I'll tell you what, you know what I really like about uh, uh, Coach uh, Joe Pa, uh, as they called him, is that he offered me a scholarship. I think that's pretty awesome. I have a lot of respect uh, for for him and uh, for him to offer me a scholarship. I that's a that's a cool thing for me because that's a to me that's a, an achievement, an achievement. So I appreciate that. And uh, you know we're gonna get going here. We're gonna have Dennis folks come up, great linebacker man for the mountains. Hit the Daryl Tally. I think we're at pow 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 right. Ah, oh, then he had Todd. You know the lovely Todd Campbell. You know, you know, you had some guys, Jeff Dean, a linebacker, you know, oh my gosh, I, you know, you're going to see it here, and, and uh, uh, some great players, I'm going to show you something really cool, I got something surprise for folksy man, but let's go ahead, and let's go ahead, drop in, what, what do we see here, let's go to the chat room, and the chat, what do we have here starting off, boy, you guys are already rolling here, uh, let's see, what's up, Jackson, what's up, Mounder Nation, very nice, all right. Let's see, Mike Dunlap, recruited by Joe. All right, Mikey, Mike Dunlap. Hey, we're going to keep our code. Listen, man, Mikey just got his uh, kidney transplant, and he's got to get heart surgery uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. We got the we got the GoFundMe. Uh, it's Polkadot66 for PayPal at Polkadot66. Mikey, you can write that on there. Go ahead, write that on there. If you don't like the GoFundMe account, whatever you like, man, uh, Go ahead. And we got Kelly Court, I Wolf Bat. What's up, Kelly? How you doing, brother? And what else do we have here? Oh, hey, what's up, guys? What's up? Let's see. We got you guys are you guys are meeting every day. It's like a party, man. Every every day is, uh, is like a party. I, I appreciate. It. How's that, Jay Paterno, man? Cool. On the Wolf Man's call, you get the truth, man. You understand is that this is what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the team at, at Happy Valley, and it's tough. They're used to winning up there. The Mountaineers got their hands full, but who cares? We're Mountaineers, man, and we got to go up there and fight. Stu Merritt's a good show. All right. We're just getting rolling, man, just getting rolling. And what else? Hey, man, okay. I'm just rolling right on through all this, man. Coming down here. Let's see. Didn't want to face that when he was coach. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man, you know, and he was really good. You know, he was uh, – he actually played quarterback at Penn State. I uh, don't think he got a lot of reps there because they had some really good football players. But the guy's legit. He was a Division One player. Don't sit there and say, you know, um, whatever. Like he got, he, he got it because he's good. And he, he, he did his due diligence, due diligence to get where he got. Says, is it an honor growing up watching the greatest and coach maternal coach? Yeah, was it an honor watching coach? That's right, Mike. Mike, that's great. Great show, Wolfie. All right. Got it like that, Gregory. Thank you so much. Okay, so I said we're going to QR code it, and we're just waiting here for folksy man to get on. And let's see, right here, Mikey. There you go, Mike Dunlap, go fund me. You can QR code. Hey, listen, man, 10, 20 bucks, whatever. Go ahead and, and drop it in there. Mike's, he can, he can use your help, and we really appreciate that. And and so the go fund me, you can QR code that. That will be up there on uh, the site. The sports column, Band of Brothers, then and now. Frank Fear, the author, he's a historian. He's on our show every Monday. Comes on sometimes periodically when something factual <laughs> we need. But I need my facts back. Because you know I can screw up facts left and right. I can. I mean, I, I throw facts out there. I have no idea if they're true or not, uh, even though I think they might be true in my head. All right, so let me go. Paul Mini Rechargers and Batteries. Listen, man, I'm telling you, you'll never buy another AA battery again. You'll never buy it. It's, it's Paula Mini. And there we go. So ours the Grange, AGC. All right, ours the Grange Company Hemp. Switch the hat, man. Get off the tobacco. Get off the nicotine. You can get at Parmar Stores, our, our main sponsor here. You can go to wolfmandip.com and go right to AGC. And let's see here. West Virginia United. That's right, Johnny Cantwell. All right, buddy. West Virginia United, you go to the website. You, you've seen it. There you go. Very good. All right. I see Denny's uh, folksy here. Let's see if he's uh, on board. What's up, Dennis? Hey, what's up? What's up? Wolfley, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Doing great. And it's good to see you. The last time I saw you is uh, when you were in town in Morgantown when uh, D 
VT was, uh, what was he doing? Oh, it was the number. The number was being retired, man. I'll tell you what. Uh, that's some good stuff. And I've got some good memories there. And, and Mountaineer Nation welcomes you, brother. And it's good to see you, man. And and how you doing? I'm doing fine, man. Just, uh, you know, living day by day and uh, doing great, man. Just enjoying life. Oh, that's great. And, you know, when I, I got something for you. Let's just get right into it because this is this is going to make me laugh. Uh, I think it's going to make you laugh even more, which is why I did this. So here we go. Let's see here. Nose guard for Park, Ohio. Todd Campbell, defensive tackle, New Kent's defensive end. Jeff Seals, outside linebacker, Seals Spring Merrill. Say hi to my brother, Jane. Dennis Folks, Columbus, Ohio, inside linebacker. Jeff Dean, inside linebacker, Williams County, West Virginia. Bill Talley, outside linebacker, East Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, that was from the 1981 Peach Bowl, man. And uh, I just wanted to get that on there. That bring back some memories? Yes, it does. <laughs> what kind of memories does that bring for you, my man? Like, what, oh, what's, what's, give me a story. That Peach Bowl, that was our first bowl, man, we got to go to with under Don Nealon, and it was great, man. Had a great time and had a pretty good game, too, at that. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, did. Uh, I actually watched it again. Yeah, we, we were uh, in Florida and uh, got a chance to beat them. Let them uh, let everybody know that we was on the map. Oh, that's very cool. All right, folks, so tell me this, man. Uh, you and DT, you were a heck of a one-two punch together. Uh, what was it like playing with – with Daryl Talley, I should, and I asked Daryl Talley, what's it like playing with Folksy? Because, you know, you guys really were, uh, you know, you saw you saw Todd uh, Campbell there, you saw Dave Oblak, Dean, you know, uh, you guys really were the beginning of the modern day Mountaineers, right? There was a time there that after when Coach Bowden went down with Coach Signetti, that you guys, you know, slipped a little bit, but you came back up and you made the waves, man, and and it was just your hard hitting, your tough playing, you're going in there and kicking the can out of Florida. You know that, that's what made you special. Yeah, that was real special. Yeah, it was it was like like you said uh, when I got there, I came in seventy nine, and I was still under uh, Coach Signetti recruited me, and I'm I'm happy for that. Definitely grateful for going WVU, and then uh, in eighty. Don Nealon came in and uh, changed the uniforms. We got out of the old stadium. You know, we played. I played the, in the old stadium. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I got the last interception in the old stadium off of Dan Marino when we was playing pitch. And then we opened up the new one. I never heard that story. Yeah, and then we uh, opened up the new stadium against Cincinnati, and I got the first interception <laughs> there. Now, I heard that one, but I did not hear about the last one. No, he didn't say the last one and the first one. I uh, put that together. Uh, I pretty much know my stuff, too, for history. Wow. That's good, yeah, we, man. I'm going to use that. Yeah, we have, I think we had pit on the ropes. If I could have got in the end zone, we would have. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. All right, so uh, that's going to be a great trivia question for the future when everybody forgets about it. I'm going to write that down and, and make sure that I use that. Okay, so – What's your favorite uh, memory in a game that, you know, that you knew that you guys were changing and, and becoming competitive uh, attitude-wise? I mean, it was you and DT and, and Cambo and all I mean, again, you guys are some tough – I mean, you had Newberry down there, safety. Yeah. Man. I mean, you know, Timmy Agee was there. Timmy I mean, Agee was there. A lot of tough guys, yeah. I, yeah, I think I mean, it was definitely the, probably the Oklahoma game. Uh, when we uh, went into Norman and beat them, I think we was the first team to ever beat them on on opening day. They had never lost a game on opening day, and I think we was the first team to do that. And uh, we uh, talking about we was gonna wilder like like uh, roses in the heat. And uh, at the beginning, we was because we I think they 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 went up fourteen nothing on us right off the bat. Yeah, and I, I think uh, DT had a, a cold or something, and we you know it was 105, 110 on there. And he's he's struggling, and and the deal was struggling, and and we all, we all just uh we knew we had a great 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 game plan going in, and we knew we could beat them, and uh, turned the ties there, and I think that season there, you know that 
that that game there and that season there turned it around for all of us. Uh, is it true? I mean, I'm trying to remember now. Didn't DT, didn't you sit there and say, hey, DT, you need, and I'm saying Daryl Taylor, uh, I'm saying you said you need to get your game going, you need to get your can moving. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that was true. Yeah, it, I, not in that, not in the words there, a little harsher, but uh, he's having a rough time, man. I and I can understand that he's having that rough time because he he had uh, had a cold and uh, it is hot out there on that field. And and basically, I just told him, "Look here, man, you you better than that. You better than that." I said I, I said you better than that. I said I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what your temperature is. We got to pick this game up. And we got to win this game. And, and that's what happened after I got on him. And I, well, basically, I got on the whole defense. I said, man, we're better than this. They, I mean, the first two times they touched the ball, they scored on us. It's 14 nothing. Wow. Wow. Well, that, you know, well, that was your senior year, too, right? Senior year. Yeah, senior year. So you left right, with that and a great season that you had. Uh, what, what's, your, what's your high point? Of, I know you went to the NFL, uh, but what your high point in college? What was it? High point in college. Oh, man. I just, just come to WVU and uh, probably getting a starting stop, uh, spot at, as a freshman, you know, because that was still the 70s and they didn't like uh, playing freshmen a lot. You know, they had just started getting into playing freshmen. So I, I think that that there, knowing that, I, uh, you know, coming out of high school that I was enough to play and start as a freshman in the Division One school. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. You were from Cleveland, right? No, Columbus. Columbus. Oh, all right. Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, coming to WVU and, and making this just what did you find out about WVU that made you guys start to turn and win? All right. What was it? Was it, and I've asked everyone that's come on the show and that's a, been a player, what was it about WVU and the hardness? toughness maybe not always the most talented folks not always that uh, overall team wise not saying about individuals but overall team wise but heart of lions man heart of lions and and made up what being a mountaineer is oh man just just getting uh doing the gritty uh, you know just getting down and dirty and, and gritty with everything you know uh, we came in you know we had uh, my freshman year we had a losing season and uh just wanted to turn things around. And I think Don Nealon was a uh, great, great for us there. When we turned things around, we started seeing new uniforms come in, the change of the uniforms. Uh, you know, we still had the uh, older guy that was going out and uh, telling us and, re and telling us that we used to be a great team. But we can still be that great team, but it's up to y'all now. And just all the, all the, uh, the players that I met, the different players that I met from Maryland, you know, from, uh, Cleveland, from Pennsylvania, West Virginia. I, I would just say the guys that that I was, was with there and uh, there was was just a great great moment with there. Just to play with guys that you know, guys that if I went went to went to WVU, I wouldn't have never met them, and I don't think I would change anything about that. And I was still, you know, people always ask me, you go to a, a different university now?" I said, "No," because of the experience I had with not only the players but the fans. Uh, the students, we interacted with, uh, when Towers was around, we interacted, interacted with the uh, students a whole bunch. You know, we had a lot of guys that we hung around with that wasn't ball players, that wasn't athletes. Yeah, you're right about that. And, you know, I guess it's that mountaineer mentality that I saw my brother Ronnie, but he came and he was a part of you and, and he credits you guys uh, as Ronnie credits you in particular, and DT, uh, having to go one on ones and smash mouth and hit and, and how you taught him so that him and let others like him. So, you guys really kind of started it and, and transferred that up, and it just grew and it's grown ever since. And you can't. In West Virginia, in my mind, you can't be successful unless you're blue collar, man, and you're hard hitting and you're hard nosed and you grind it and you go to work every day. Right. It's like, you know, with Ron, man, he he was a fullback, and, and you know, and back then everybody liked to run the ISO. So in one on one, it was always me and Ron going up against each other. So he made me better, and in the turn, I made him better. 
you know, and, and, and some plays we would take off. We say, man, we're doing this just for the looks. We ain't going full out this time. And we would have that agreement. And then we would have an agreement with Ron, we got to go full out this time. They, they, they looking at us hard and we got players behind us. That's, that's looking up to us. So we got to go hard this time. But that, that, that time, I'm going to tell you, Ron made me a better player, you know, because like I say, everybody we, we played against, we got to stop the ISO. And the, the way to stop the ISO is with the inside linebacker. And even we ran the ISO. And, and, and the way to have a successful ISO is the fullback. Yeah, there's 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 absolutely no doubt about it. Did you notice that the fullbacks are still coming? They're creeping slowly back into the game. They could be an H back. It could be a tight end in the backfield. But they're really using that fullback formation. And I'm seeing a little bit of ISO coming back again. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's great, man. That, that is great. Like you say, they're using them as H backs, and now, and the talent of the kids now, they can they can do everything. You know, usually a fullback, that's all he did was blocked. He might get the ball once or twice in a game. Now, you know, he they they move him out to the H. He, he's a receiver. He's a runner. He's a decoy. You know, they they're doing a lot of things because the guys are when you have a H back or a fullback that's that's a at least 260, 280 pounds, can, can run a four seven. That's tough on a on a defensive back when he's yeah. trying to protect him, especially when he goes to the H and he's six seven. He he got him over hype. He he got speed and everything. So that that's turning the tur the corner definitely in the NFL, and I'm pretty sure it's going to reach more and more into the college league too. That's for sure. Yeah, we have the best guys. So we got we got Dennis Folks here today. Graduate 1982, and part of that whole turnaround program with so many great Mountaineers. And, and well, well, we go back to it. Now, there's a time before you could go back and before to Mountaineers. They were tough as well, and they grew. But, again, there's some loss there. And in that time, you guys found yourselves, and you started it. And it really hasn't diminished very much from there. Because even today, and this is what I'm leading this whole thing up to, even today, for the Mountaineers to be successful, they still have to have that Mountaineer mentality, that blue-collar work ethic. Am I right or am I wrong? You're right. You're right about that. Like I say, when uh, Don came in, he changed the whole floor format, and uh, that, that, and we got to rolling then because I think after that, we went to like 17, 18 straight bowls in a row. Mm -hmm. So, that yeah, that was – we did start the uh, – the ball rolling at the WVU and uh, we just had a great time, man, you know, against, uh, and back then we was independent, you know, we played Pittsburgh every year. We played Penn state. We played the Maryland's. We, you know, we, we played a lot of good, good schools that have uh, good rosters and, and, uh, and uh, good strength on, on their teams. Yep. That is completely correct. I mean, let's, let's just think about that. I just had Jay Paterno on. In fact, he was, I think he was, well, he might have been more my age than yours. I'm not sure because uh, he looks he looks actually younger than I do, but I don't know. Uh -huh. But he was there for 17 years. He coached with Joe Paterno. Let's talk about this Penn State and how tough they were and how tough it looks like they are this year. What was the deal about Penn State back in your day? Oh, Back in my day, I, you know, as a freshman, I think Penn State was the first team to – have a 300 pound offensive line. And then you you put uh Matt Sui back there at 240, Booker Moore at 240, and then you throw in a, a speedy Kurt Warner. <laughs> Man, that offense was hell to stop, I'm telling you. As a freshman, they I think they just drug me all over the field, you know what I mean? <laughs> they just drug, but but we stayed in it. I think I even, you know, even though they beat us that year, they might have gave me a defensive player of the game just just for being tough, and uh, and I think after that we we just said we're we're not gonna get get beat on like that again by Penn State, you know, and Joe Paterno and his staff, you know, and uh, and then after I left WVU, uh, Walker Lee Ashley, one of the linebackers from uh, Penn State, he was drafted by the Vikings in the third round, and uh, and then when I went to the Vikings, me and him became great friends, and we still are great friends, but. Back then, they they had speed, they had strength, they had talent. Uh, they was just overall. I think pretty. I'm pretty sure they won the national championship in '82, my senior year. Could be right. I can't recall off the top of my head, but I'm gonna take your word for it. Since you know, <laughs> they, they won, I remember when I was being 
recruited uh, by that. And are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> I remember I was being recruited, and, and uh, they were at the championship game against Miami, and Coach Paterno called me and, he, and at halftime. And I'm like, that's crazy, man. I almost went to Penn State. <laughs> right. You know, because right. it was that tradition. It was that what you projected, I guess. And the fact is that West Virginia, though we don't have a great record, the games became competitive uh, from the start, your start. They didn't get rolled over. 84, beat them. 88, we beat them. Uh, you know, again, is 87, I went to Penn State, should have beat them. 89, should have beat them. But see, that's the thing, folksy. All right? And you said, didn't you say that you, uh, or no, I was pet you were talking about, but, you know, you get there and you get them, but something happens up there at Happy Valley. They call it Happy Valley for a reason. Yes. It's for them. And, you know, what is it? What's the difficulties about playing in, the, in that Beaver Stadium? I don't know, man. It, it's something about that stadium. Because I think one year we, we lost 15 to 13 to them, and we had them. Had them right on the ropes. And if I'm not mistaken, Kurt Warner uh, took a kickoff all the way back, and that's what won them the game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they did things to pull it out. 87, uh, I think it was something – just like that. So again, is what are the challenges now that this Mountaineer football team? Do you think that you see was going to go up to Happy Valley Beaver Stadium? What challenges will they have rolling in there? Well, the defense definitely will have a challenge with the offense. They, you know, they're 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 grinding out team. They will run that ball on you. Now they can pass the ball. They have they have great players, just like we have great players right now. But. You know, I'm a defensive guy, and, I, and I'm just saying that defense has got to step up. We got to have some turnovers, and, and uh, definitely we got we got a good defense going to have to put some points on the board through a fumble or pick off interception and take it all the way back or safety. You know, defense is always in the mix when it comes to winning or losing a game. Let me ask you this. Watching this team the last couple of years, what have you noticed that – you think that they should improve upon for defensive line? What was that again? On uh, defensively, what do you think they should improve upon? Uh, I think they need to. I don't like the three feet, three three five defense for one thing because you can run all over it. I, I like the uh, the four three defense or the three four because when you run that three three five, you got to have three defensive linemen that are big mm -hmm. and fast. In tough. And, you know, I look at, you look at most of the teams that win national championships, they win in it with the, uh, the, the three, the three, four right now, mm -hmm. or the four, three, four defensive linemen. That's going to hawk hawk that quarterback, hawk him down. And, you know, you look at that SEC who's ruling everything. They don't care if they going against a passing team or not. They don't switch that. They keep the four big guys on that quarterback. Yep. <laughs> they, they they do, and the thing too is, but even when you go to three four, you got a you got a, a in between guy that's a bad dude. I mean, yes, pass rusher, or he can drop. I mean, it really, right. you know what I mean. So uh, I, I like that as well. But in that three three five, you, you're talking about a safety. You're talking about a nickel. You, you know what I mean? You, there's, there's a difference there. And you're talking so, about a guy that's not as big as a regular linebacker that should be in there. Exactly. So <laughs> with that being said. And this offensive line for Penn State, and they're about 320. And we can look at our, our guys here. We have a guy uh, that's 309, Lockhart, the nose guard. We have a guy that's 283, another guy that's 290. I mean, that's that's just the top three because the other people are smaller. How are they going to go ahead and try to stop against this Penn State? Because just, just explain to everybody, because you're a linebacker, you played in the NFL, you understand what – forcing somebody's well, what eventual running can do if they just wear you down. Oh, it, it wears you down. If, if, if your uh, defense, you know, that nose tackle, I'm probably sure he's a two technique. If he can't keep people off that inside linebacker, the guards from getting up on that linebacker, it, it, it makes it for a hard day when you have a line that's averaging 320 pounds and your defensive line is probably an average of, uh, what, 290 at the most. And, uh, it just wears them down. But because uh, we are lighter, we should be faster in getting around people. But you just cannot let offensive guards get up on your linebackers that fast. You got to you got to try to, uh, you know, 
hold them, block them, or whatever to keep them off your linebacker so that linebacker for all three of your linebackers can flow and make tackles. If they can do that, keep their offensive line off their off our linebackers, and they can flow and just make tackles, we, we can, work, we can get, uh, make them go to a passing game. And that's what you got to do with somebody like Penn State. You don't want them running the ball on them. You want to force them to pass the ball on them. But if we can – you know, get some blitzes up there, get some linebackers blitzing, get some uh, run blitzes. I think we could we, we have a great chance if, if uh, we have a uh, we have to have a good defensive scheme to stop this team. No, nah, there's there's no doubt, especially when they go 12 personnel and their tight ends are as big as their tackles. Uh, you know, you, you know, all that goes. But again, it's a challenge. This is a challenge. So that means it's an opportunity as well with the number seven team in the country. Largest crowd a Mountaineer team will ever play. I played at Penn State in 87. It was only, I think, uh, 95 at the time or something like that. Uh, we played out at uh, Texas. I think it was 101,000. Not I was coaching then. Or I know I was broadcasting then. Mm-hmm. And so this is going to be 107. This is the, the biggest crowd, live crowd, that a Mountaineer team will ever play. And that's that's pretty amazing. And it's, it's, so it's a great opportunity, but at the same time, what do they have to do? I asked Jay Paterno the same question. I'm going to ask you, what does this team have to do to go in there and steal a victory away from the Nittany Lions? Number one thing is uh, no turnovers. Number two, we have to uh, create turnovers. If we can go in and have no turnovers and move the ball on them, uh, keep their defense on the field, and keep our defense off and wear their defense down with our offense, we we have a good chance of beating Penn State this year. Would you say that Jay Paterno said, boy, with Garrett Green, if he's in third and long situations, that's bad news for WVU. So would you say, with that being said, how big does first downs make in this game? Because people are saying, oh, third downs are huge. And this, I'm saying – you ain't gonna get those third downs unless you get good big first downs. Right. We we first downs. We 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 gotta have them uh, tackle for a loss or uh, or or or, the, or or no gain at all. If we can get them in uh, third and long instead of getting them in third and short, that that helps us out there. So we definitely gotta keep them third and long instead of third and short. And we definitely gotta have on that first down play. We definitely gotta have a, a minus or even just break it even, or a two- to three-yard game. We can't have big chunks on a first down. When you get big chunks on first down, but basically the offense, they, they got a whole – they can just go to their, into their whole trick bag when they when they, they second, and, second and three, third and two, you know, and that's what we have to do. We, we definitely got to uh, – that, that first down, we, we, we got to have tackle for losses. We got to have that, that going for us. You know, and that's exactly the opposite on the flip side is that the Mountaineer offensive line really has to get four or five yards chopping at it so they don't have to have be in those third and long situations as well. Because we know this, both quarterbacks are really uh, young, okay? Right. He's making his first start uh, for Penn State, and uh, Green is making his second or third from last year. He had a couple. So when you put that together, all right, and you got these two rookies, okay? I don't want to say rookies, but young guys. What do you want to do if you're defense? If you're Manny Diaz over here or if you're Jordan Leslie over here for WV, what do you want to do to these quarterbacks? You want you you want to uh you definitely want to get them off 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 their uh off their game. And that and that way you you want to show different uh formations, you know, confusing them. You definitely want to confuse them with different formations, line up one way and go another way. And you just want to keep pressure on them. They're both young. And if we can get them into turnovers, that would be great for us. Yeah. Let me ask you this. How about the skies? You think that's one disguising your secondary coverage? The skies yeah. Going the skies and everything. Yeah, we had to disguise everything. Disguise the blitzes. Disguise when we're not blitzing. Blitzing when we're not blitzing. And uh, uh, not blitzing and blitzing. So we we just gotta uh, we gotta have a, a good game plan, you know. Because yeah. like I say, uh, a good defense will beat a good offense. You know what I mean? And that'll make and that'll make the game. And plus, we can't turn over the ball. You know, we have a young quarterback too, so he can't throw interceptions. And uh, he has to go in and 
the coach has to give him, you know, his first 10 plays, something that, that he's comfortable with and keep him comfortable the whole game. That is so true. And so, again, now, you want to go ahead. Even Tom Brady, even as great as Tom Brady is, or you'd pick any great quarterback you could think of. When you keep putting pressure on him, when you keep getting waxed, you may, you might, we're talking quarterback hurries now, all right? We're not only just sacks. Oh, yeah, you want to sack, but if you can go ahead and be in his face, how much does that screw up a quarterback? Oh, that screws up everything. That screws him up real bad because he, he 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 he's looking for that guy now, and then especially when you get pressure from both sides, he's looking at both guys now. He's like, "Wow, man, these guys are really putting pressure. And you're getting him off his game now. You know what I mean? He's not he's not comfortable, and we don't want him to be comfortable. So when you even Tom Brady, when he's not comfortable, you know he's throwing that ball away, you know, and uh, you know, and and forcing and forcing mistakes. So. We, we definitely want to do that, get them off the game and force mistakes to the quarterback. Yep. And so, Dennis, folks, you are the defensive coordinator for WVU. You see this offense, and are you going to go, let's well, say passing downs, yes, but are you going to go ahead and put those corners on an island because those receivers are have not been gelling with this quarterback for a long time, okay? They're new receivers except for the uh, Keandre Lambert Smith, number one. Okay, he's he's been there, but are you going to go ahead and shut down the run? So you're the. What's your philosophy? Is what I'm trying to get at for this yeah. game. Uh, this game is you, you want to shut down the runs. You you want to keep your corners up tight until they can until they can show us they can beat us over the top. So the more people we have for the run game, that's forcing the run game and not the passing game. And if, and like I say, if, if we can get some shut down corners on them, that we can go man to man on them and they can't get over top of us, and we can have that run support. Uh, you know, a quarterback is always good when he's extra run support. So we can stop that run and, and make them a one-dimension team. That is right on in my, in my mind, spot on, whatever you want to say. But now that I have you, I have to ask this question. And because in the college game especially, now in the NFL, tight ends are getting really successful. We know what they're expanding. People are saying, like, well, we can really do some things, you know, some great – tight ends, some that are more receivers, but other they, they go into the tight end role. But for you as a linebacker all right, in college ball, how can you defend the tight end? Because the tight end is now, now the NFL is showcasing tight ends. The college game is moving on, and it's it's getting showcasing tight ends in their own way. How can you stop that in college? Because college is notorious for not defending a tight end. You got to get a hit on him, and that's what we did when we was – when he comes across the inside linebacker place face or the outside linebacker, we 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 don't want you to run, let him run loose. We want you to get a hit on him, get a good hit on him, you know, to stop his momentum, to knock him off of his his, his route. So that's how you defeat that tight end by uh, always getting a hit on him, never let him go, never, never let him run free. And that's why nowadays they flexing that tight end out, so your defensive end or your linebackers or your inside linebackers cannot get a hit on. Him. But we need to get a hit on that tight end. They'll never let him run free. So does that mean, like, if he's inside that five yards, he's he's eight? Oh yeah, get a hit on him before you get in your drop. <laughs> all right. All right. Let me see what else to the question. I got all these things I want to ask a defense. Now I forgot. Uh, way to go, my with me. I'm telling you, man, my memory is great. All right. So, folks, see, let's go. What's your um, what's your prediction? Uh, they're going up there. You see the team. You follow the team. And you also know what's awaiting for them up at Penn State. Uh, how do you think it's going to work out? Oh, no, that's a night game, too. Yeah. And it's going to be white out. So every time I watch Penn State against West Virginia, I mean, uh, Ohio State or anybody, that when they have a white out, man, we got, we got to take the crowd out the game. Definitely got to take the crowd out the game because that crowd, I didn't see when they played Ohio State how – Ohio State could be beating them, and next thing you know, they come up with a big play, get the crowd back in it. That that stadium be jumping and bouncing, and oh man, I had I had the opportunity uh, last year to to go see a Penn State game because my uh, oldest son Marcus, he's a Big Ten referee, so uh, I went up last year to watch uh, uh, Penn State play. And what did you think? Oh, that that stadium is old and huge. <laughs> and if you can keep the crowd out of it, 
And uh, I forgot who it is playing, but it was a pretty good game. You know, they kept the crowd out of it. The crowd wasn't getting too loud. And uh, and that was one of the games where they 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 really had to fight to win, you know, to scrap scrap back to win. And, and it was a real good game. I forgot who they was playing, but uh, I was up there last year watching them play. <laughs> Yeah, we yeah, had that crowd. <laughs> what are you about my readers? Yeah, look at that. That, that is incredible there. Yep. You know, and uh, Jay Paternal just said uh, before you got on that Urban Meyer said when you have the night games, it's louder than LSU's, which he thought was LSU. And I've been to both, actually. I played at Penn State for. It wasn't a night. It turned. Remember how we used to play late afternoon? It was right. Yeah. And but I've been to LSU when West Virginia went down there and played them, and and it was pretty darn loud. That's crazy there at Penn State. So they got a challenge there. And last, I'm going to ask you is that when you have challenges like that kind of noise right off the bat, what do you have to do as a player? These are young guys overall. The offensive line is older. You got Nestor. You got uh, Fred. Right. You know. You got White, even White Miles growing up. But, you know, Thomas Remax, young. But, again, you have a lot of uh, young players, maybe sophomores, third-year guys. But how do they overcome the challenges in keeping their mind focused? Well, thing they got to do is uh, minimize mistakes. Can't make a lot of mistakes. You got to go in there saying, all right, yeah, we are playing Penn State, but they put their pants on the same way we put our pants on. You know what I mean? They, 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 their, their goal is the same goal we have is, is to come out here and win this game. So I think if they can, as, as, as young players, know your game plan, know your responsibility, and do your responsibility and minimize the mistake, that's going to help the young players a lot. That's for sure. All right, everybody. Here you go, Dennis, folks, man. I appreciate it. Hey, I want you to come back uh, during the season if you would. And I will. Go ahead and talk about this, see what you see, uh, get your expert advice, because this about the Wolfman's call this show it is about for our brotherhood here, our modern brothers being a, a vehicle for you to talk and, and say what you want to say and, and talk about the expertise, because we all have an interest. We all have value in it. So I want you to come back. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Will do. All right. God bless. Take care now. All right. All right, everybody. That's tennis, folks. I call you know I call him folksy man. He's just a cool dude. I'll tell you what was not cool about it is when he hit you. I'm telling you right now, this man would hit you. You go ahead and you want to run up the middle. He ain't kidding about the isles. Okay, the isles no joke, man. When you have a fullback, that's a fullback, and you got a linebacker, it's a linebacker. That collision, whoo, baby. You don't know until you've gone ahead and done that. And we appreciate folks you coming on and doing that with us so again uh what do we got here what's going on let's let's check out here what are you guys talking about here on the list it's anything anyone got any questions how about this i want to drop it here mountain nation join the conversation right there we go somebody qr something over there that's pretty cool i like that there you go you want to come on this is your opportunity now let me tell you about tomorrow a little bit because what we're having is we're gonna have uh, cover two data is going to come on Jeff Davies and he's made up this advanced analytics. He calls it money ball for the masses. These analytics are so good. It's going to help. We're going to, we're going to do something different. So Monday through Thursday is the Wolfman's call regular show. And except for this Saturday, cause you all know, I've been telling you uh, at the pallet bar, Scott Depot, West Virginia, what's up pallet? Yeah, right there at the pallet bar, we are going to do a pregame. And usually, it's that pregame, well, that film breakdown will be on Fridays. So guess what? Fridays, Wolfman's Call, it's not going to be just Monday through Thursdays. It's going to be Fridays. And that, that game breakdown, that film breakdown, is also going to include advanced analytics, film breakdown, and wow, taking those analytics, taking my knowledge with the film breakdown and breaking it down for you. And we're going to talk and say, what do we think is good? What line is good? Yeah, what line? But you know what? Disclaimer, all right? 
if I tell you I like something and it don't work out for you, that's on you. If it works out for you and I told you something good, still on you. But I'll take a little bit of credit. For, I'll give you a wink. But regardless, but that's what we're going to do. So that we're going to come out and we're going to lay down our best knowledge. We're saying the numbers are this. The film says this. My expertise, and that's what I'm telling you, my expertise says this, my user experience, and this is the Wolfman's pick. We'll see what happens. We'll see how it goes. But cover to that. It's a, a group that started Jeff Davies. He's coming on tomorrow at 4 o'clock. You want to watch it because he's got these one-page better. I mean, this is some really, really cool stuff. No one else is doing this, man. No one else. And, I, and you'll see what I mean by this. Is that you say, hey, well, no, no, I'm telling you. No one else. Is, if you want to be the smartest guy in the room about football, if you want to go ahead and maybe go ahead and play something down, if you want to be a little bit risky, well, you've come to the right place. And that's going to be Friday. So it's going to be Monday through Friday, except for this Friday. You're not going to do it. But tomorrow, cover two, baby. Woo. Hey, I guess what? We also got Tony Altimore coming on tomorrow as well. And you know how good that is. Right? Okay, everybody's going to jump on here, man. Uh, let's see here. What do you got here? I like Timothy. There you go. There's some really cool space or specs you have there, Dennis. Oh, okay. It's glasses. I got it. All right. I had to think about that one. How about this? It's an opportunity of a lifetime for some. Okay. Penn State beat Georgia in the Sugar Bowl in 82, 27 to 23. Excellent. All right. I, mean, I already put this up here, Mike, but I'll put it up again. That 1982 uh, WVU team punch you right in the mouth. That's right. But so would every other WVU team after that. And that's what I'm talking about with, with uh, folksy. That's what I was trying to get at is, you know, people, hey, Daryl Taylor is, I call him King DT. All right. So that should pretty much sum up how I feel about him. But I'm going to tell you this. That is, folks, man, he has no joke. No joke. That dude would light you up. That's why I played in the NFL. And that's why I was so interested in what he thought about the tight ends and, and all that. Because that's an expert. Because what you give and and you see that, you study film forever. You, you got it. When you get that level, you got to become an expert. Because all you do is study film. That's all I do is watch film, break it down. I learned from Mike Jacobs. I'm so, so happy that I did. So be, before he passed away, what a thing it was. He was two, he's offense coordinator for two 11 and 0 teams, two offenses that rocked. And you know what? I was just really privileged to learn from such a great dude that I could go ahead and go undefeated twice as an offensive coordinator. Because he taught me so much. And I played under him because he was a guards and centers coach as well. So he was my coach growing all the way through my time at West Virginia, came back as a graduate assistant coach, did all that mentoring, became lifelong friends. Started off as the meanest dude I thought in the world. Started off that way, and then after every year, freshman year, yeah, you know, I was just a slap. I was a slapper, if you know what I mean. Sophomore year, all right, you know, you're grooving. I was a four-year letterman, so, you know, I, I, I got in there. Junior year, more respect. By the time senior years, he was giving you the respect that you earned. And there's some in, in the college ball and coaching world. Now, I just don't know if that's still in there, but I know that I benefited greatly from it. I had to earn that respect for Mike Jacobs. And all, then as I started as a coach, I had to earn it again. I was again, like, yo, man, <laughs> you just be a pup in coaching. You just be a pup in coaching. So this is what you got to do. This is what you have to go through. And so I'm so appreciative. But now I see things. I see things that I watch film. I remember, you know what? I have his, his voice in my head that says, Wolf, look at that. Look at that. Because it all came from him. It came nothing with me. Nothing came from him. And that's how great, great he was. So with that being said, let's go ahead and head it up here with uh, the Neil Brown press conference. And let's start answering uh, and talking and seeing what I think and maybe what you think. Because I left this, remember, it's wide open now. It's out there. You can jump on. All, I'm going to tell you, Kenny, you got to have a shirt, man. All right? That's all I'm going to say. You got to have a shirt. But I love having you on. <laughs> and that goes for anybody else. All right, here we go. 
Um, they're talented everywhere. Uh, they played extremely well down the stretch last year. Um, they're an attacking group, play a lot of man coverage, mix a little bit with some zone pressures. Ooh, yeah, that's what he's talking about, man. It is right there, Penn State. And guess what, man? Uh, they're going to bring it. They are going to bring it. They're going to go ahead, and I think they're going to put their, their uh, corners on an island, uh, certainly in passing downs. I think they're going to put a spy on Garrett Green on passing downs. I, I for sure think that. So you have to be on offense, all right, say, well, that's if I know what they're going to do, or I think, excuse me, I think I know what they're going to do because you just heard the defensive line is good enough to rush four and put constant pressure. I don't think against our offensive line they are. I think they're going to have to bring some heat, and I think they're going to have to spy Garrett Green because if he does get out of the box, he can do damage with his legs. All right, so... But, but on, the, on the flip side of that, what's going on in my head, man? What am I thinking about? Well, if they're going to do that, that means that I have to change up to be unexpected. All right? First downs can't be all hit. Although the offense line is so important, we talked about this, that guess what? They have to be a running. They have to be able to run the ball even when the box, the numbers are not in your favor. You have to be able to do so against this Penn State defense. But at the same time, can you get a little creative? Can you run a bootleg, man? How about this? How about freaking everybody out and walking up underneath the center and be like, yeah, get in a back behind you or maybe in an eye or, or a split back, whatever, and then run a bootleg. So you have two choices, right? You can have Garrett throw the ball or Nico, whoever's in the game, because I still believe that Nico's going to get a chance to get in this game. Again, Neil Brown historically, historically, his third series in each half put in his uh, put in his second team quarterback to do a drive, and so that they can give him in case the first team guy gets hurt. So it would not be crazy for Nico not to be in there. But again, he could do the same thing because he can run. Both of them can run. So go ahead, give him that option to either pass the ball. Or run. See, but now you've enhanced it. You just made it more complex, right? Now you're putting a defense in a bind. Well, if he runs, I got to run up there and stop him. But then if he's good at that, then you just can flip it over the top when you commit it. Yeah. And it's, it's things like that. So if you know what you think they're going to do and go ahead and try to not always be that we're going to run inside zone on first down because we got to run the ball. Yes, you do have to run the ball, but you don't have to make it known. You can run the ball. You can run it different ways. You can be creative, and you can also inject play action passes at key opportune times. It's it's almost like you got to know how to win and have that touch. It's a magic touch, right? All right, I think I explained it. If I didn't, let me know right here. Go ahead. Come on on or go ahead and, and, and fill it in. Here we go. Next one. These are long spaces here. Too long, um, actually. There we go. Yeah, you know, I think it starts up front. It ends. They've got they've got three guys that are big time. Two, I think, guys that are potential first round picks. One for sure. Um, the interior is really good. They're they're quick. Uh, they move. They do a good job with their games up front. Oh well, you know what? So they're quick. They move. They're powerful. You can go down the line here, and I can tell you right now. That's right. Ellie's, you got uh, Beeman, you got Robinson, you know, you have uh, Isaac, uh, Adiza, you know what I mean? It's it, it, it's tough. They, they got it. There's no doubt about it. That's why you got to keep them guessing. When you have talent like that you're going against, you can't be forthright in saying, we're doing, you got to be different. I think with Neil Brown, you're going to see a lot of motioning too. Make him make sure that they're paying attention to where you're, where you start is not where you finish. And, and we'll, I'm sure he's got to test them to make sure they're aware of that. Uh, all right. And we'll get there. I'll get to you, Mike. Let's go. Come on there. And the special teams are always solid. They're, they're, they're replacing all their specialists from a year ago. Um, they they have a 
tradition of being really good in their punt return game. And so not sure who that will will be, but they've always been good there. And then Singleton's their kickoff returner. I mean, he took one to the house last year, and uh, he's a threat anytime he touches it. And so for us, it's uh, it's about getting ready to go play in a tough venue against a, against a great opponent week one. And so- hmm. Well, that's what it's about. That's for sure. You know, when you talk about special teams, here's the thing. They're always in the top 20 recruiting classes. They're going to have the athlete. So whoever's not starting is going to be an athlete that's going to be pretty good. So you know the special teams ought to be good. They do have the new starters on special teams for the actual punter and the kicker. So uh, they're replacing them. But when you go ahead and put Singleton back, I mean, you know, uh, what about what about what Coach Jay Paterno said? He goes that Katron Allen might be the best. I mean, it's it, it's crazy. 13 and 10 there, right? There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, defensively, we've got to we've got to win some some in some coverage matchups. You know they're uh, as talented as they are at running back. You know we've got to be able to cover them, and we can't give up uh, shots down the field. And then we've got to be able to tackle in one on one. You know we've got to we've got to run to the football, but we've got to be able to tackle. They're running backs in one-on-one opportunities. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that and that's key. Now let's let's talk about this real quick because when you go ahead and you think about what he said in camp, he goes, "We got to run through our tackles." Remember that? And you heard Jordan Leslie say, "Hey, we're callous tacklers, not they right? We're callous tacklers because that's what we're doing. The last scrimmage treated as treated as a real game." And let me tell you, that's a, an improvement in my mind. From what they've done in the past couple of years, because they really haven't really got into uh, being that physical attitude that they're displaying or that they're talking about right now. All right, you know what? You can't instill an attitude in a team without talking about it and then going and doing it. So when you talk about it, it means you're addressing it, so that they're becoming familiar with. You know what? We were poor tacklers last year. Probably the poorest tackling team I've seen in a long time. To be quite honest, all right? But if you're going to work on that, you're going to improve on that. That is good news. But you got to do what? You got to have those fundamentals. And now, so when you say that, now you're going to go against a team that knows how to run the ball and a team that has very talented. So we're going to find out, right? Did it work? Did it work good? Is it? Was it an improvement? Yeah, I think any time that you say we're going to be tougher and we're working, we're going to be better tacklers, I think that's an improvement because you weren't saying it last year. You weren't. What I was getting out of it last year, they were saying we're the most athletic defensive secondary that we've ever been. Now, we know that was either just wrong because they weren't that athletic. They weren't that fast. Right? Even with – with Charles Woods out, uh, or him and that didn't change the boat. All right, I'm just telling you right now, did not change it for athleticism. Now, I want to see it. So we talked about it yesterday, you know, with Koken, with Cal, Calvin Phillips, you know, show me. Missouri State, you got to show us. All right, so let's move, because I know what, I watched the film on those running backs and that offensive line, those tight ends. They showed me. I watched Ohio State. They show me. In fact, Penn State was up going into fourth quarter before the the bottom fell and they was they did some silly things. But uh, show me. And that's the truth of credit it. for he can run. He played, like I said, he played um he played a lot of fourth quarters last year. And when he played, they let him play. It wasn't like he talk about Drew Alar, the quarterback, played a lot of fourth quarters. He was just handing off, and so you've got some video. He's he's super talented. You know, he's a big kid. Um, he's more athletic than people give him credit for. He can run. Um, he he's good at scrambling and, and making plays downfield. You saw that last year. You saw that in high school. Um, he's got a huge arm. He can make all the throws. You know, he's six foot five. He's two hundred forty three pounds. I'll tell you what I do like about him. I, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, He's really good. His throws, his throws are good. You can see over the top because he's six foot five. They say he's not a great runner. No, he's not. But he's got that shiftiness to him that I see. I think he's got to work it more. I think he's still young. 
so I don't think he's there yet. But I think you got to really put pressure on this guy. So the key, the key for this game, and you watch this now, and I want you to tell me, and we're going to have Tom Bradley, Coach Scrap, who you saw there with, with, with Jay Paterno, who, who coached 33 years at Penn State, who coached three years of the Steelers, who coached here at WVU, UCLA, defensive coordinators, right? All right, so he's coming on Monday. So all this I'm telling you now is you can tell me and say, Wolf, well, you're kind of full of it. Or you can say, man, all right, uh, you understand. Because the game of football is not extremely hard. It gets complicated in certain areas and, and certain things that you do. But the overall is not. It's about forcing your will on others and being superior in execution. That's, that's what it's about. Now, there's factors into that execution and reasons in that execution and talent and all that comes in and age and wisdom and knowledge and, and skill and been there before, not all those things become factors. But the game is simple. It's about out executing the other team. And, and when you think about that and, and go in there and do that, that's what the monitors have to do. So, so this is it. And I, I'm seeing this, well, you got to do this third down. It's all about, I'm telling you right now, two young quarterbacks, two young quarterbacks. Stop them on first down. Get those chains. First down, they run the ball. Hey, make it second and eight. Make it second and eight. Make it always third and five or more. Third and four and a half or more. Because if you could do that at a consistent level, the odds turn in your favor. You want to know how you can go in and beat a team like Penn State when they're more talented, more experienced? Because they are. And if you don't think so, you're wrong. Okay? Flat out wrong. Because these guys are on a big time level. I'm talking top five, top seven, if you will. Top ten, for sure. This is the talent they have. They built this up. This They've struggled the past 10 years. Okay, this is not what they've been doing, but they're there this year. I can see it, watch them last year. But the weakness they got is a first-time quarterback. So if you could go ahead and shut down that run, I'm telling you the formula right now to shut that run down on first down and make it a long second and at least a four-and-a-half to five third down, if you can do that consistently and you can play, and you're going to have to put a little bit of pressure on this three man rushing. I don't, I don't buy it. I, you got to do something, at least mix it up so that sometimes it looks like you're coming. I mean, I, get out there, get that, the muddle huddle, right? Get the muddle huddle going. Get the muddle huddle going. Mix it up. They're not going to be playing like Texas Tech. They're not going on like hurry, hurry, jet. All right. Go ahead and be smart. You can't be too smart. You can't be too much where I'm like, we're gonna go and we're gonna show something different all the time. Whatever you gotta, you gotta play smart. It's a game of chess. So when you want to do it, first down is the key. First down because you got a quarterback that you hope. All right, let's just say. If they go ahead and if they get a lot of third and longs and they make the first downs anyway, well, then you don't got a chance anyways. We're talking about to be competitive. If you can shut their run up, that's what I love about Bill Belichick, the coach of the Patriots. He takes away the best thing you do and says, if you're going to beat us, you got to beat us with your second or third. Your second or third. Not the first. Don't give it to them. Don't give it to them. Shut it down. And if they win and they beat you the second and third, you know, tip your hat. Maybe it wasn't our day. But if you can go ahead and you do that, I'll tell you what, I'll stand up and I'll applaud. If you could shut down that Penn State run and then Jewel Lard comes out and he's this five-star quarterback that has an amazing day that with receivers that are unproven, yeah. I'll say, hey, man, you tried. And... You know what? I'll stand with you at all with you, man. I'll stand and I'll applaud. Because you know what? You got a lot to build on. Because you got heart, man. You got courage. If you go ahead and you take that away. But if you sit there and you say, well, we're going to try to defend against everything. 
uh, and you know the, the pass is important as the run. Drew Alara has not proven he's got to now. If he starts to prove it, then you got to change up. Okay, you're not going to be you're going to be thick headed and be like, well, we're staying in this forever. No, I'm telling you to be smart. That's what the, the this coaches need to do. They need to be smart and they need to get their players to understand to be intelligent, to be intelligent on the football field, on offense. Again, change it up. Be unpredictable. Yes, you have to dominate the run. Yes, you probably have to run the clock. Yes. But you do that by going ahead. You can do things, screens and, and, and play action passes and, and moving the pocket. Moving the pocket so it's not always the same. How many times did you see in the last couple of years the same pocket? The same pocket. Whether it's Deggy or, or JT, Daniel. It's like the same Move that darn pocket. Don't make it so easy. Don't be so predictable. That's what you have to do. And it's only one or two times. And it's like that read zone. You're not going to have to worry about it now with Garrett or Nico in there because they're going to pull it every once in a while. But pull that darn ball. Pull it and run so they have to worry about that. And, again, I'll tell you what, this would be the most incredible thing. Put a little option in. Oh, it doesn't take long. We did it. We did it. We were a power team under Donnell, but we had some options in there. And that totally, totally took a defense and they had to count and then go ahead and do assignment football. Okay, that's assignment. That's what you have to worry about. All right, that's enough Neil Brown for right now. Maybe I'll do a little bit more tomorrow, but I don't know. I'm just fired up. I want to look at some film. Let's go ahead. I hope you're fired up too, man, because I'm feeling it right there. I'm telling you, you want to win this game, you're going to have to do some stuff that you're probably not comfortable with. You're going to have to win at some things you probably haven't done with this team before. Up there, going against 106,000, 107,000 people, maybe, a, let's say, 10,000, 8,000 Mountaineer fans. So that's cool. Uh, that, that, that certainly helps. You've got 100,000 fans. That, it's crazy. Understand, play above the challenges. Be smarter than the noise, all right? Make sure you're in tune, you know, because you can feel that. And and I, I think yesterday Coach said or Cal said, maybe it was Cal, said that once you got started, you know, that was out. But I've got to tell you what, is that you're, he's right. Number one, he's right, because once you get going, you don't notice the crowd until you can't hear. And, and that's when it becomes difficult. But this is something cool. This right here is just the beginning. I want to show you. And this is about as first and uh, second options here. This is RPO, right? Uh, I got to go ahead and put it back on this way here. RPOs and blow up. All right, I can see better now. So we take a look here at the defense. What's he looking at here? Let's watch the play. Okay, they're going to run RPO. What's that? What's he looking at? He sees something. Okay, so the box is the numbers, and then he's going to say, okay, we're going to go past. They, check out what they did. They moved their backfield, uh, all right, because they definitely changed the play, and they're looking at the over here. They're looking out here. He's seeing that, and let's watch. I'm trying to remember. The numbers, the box, I got seven in the box. He goes, and he passes it. Look at that. He looks at one, which was here. He was covered. Do you see that? Right there, he looks at one and two. He hits. So he's looking here. This was covered. So they got two options right there on their RPO. Right there, and he gets it and watches. All right, you want to know how important tackling is against these guys? Because they're all tough. Do you know that Singleton and, and Allen, they, you know how many tackles they broke through last year? A lot. A lot. All right? You have to tackle. The Mounters better hope they're calloused in tackling like Jordan Leslie and Dante Wright say, because that's what it's going to take, and I sure as heck hope that they are, and uh, at least they're understanding it. Let's go ahead and watch this. Check it out. He's watching. He's looking. Hey, look at this. He goes, so number one, you can see it right there, is covered. He goes to number two. I love this. This is this is smart football. This really is. Uh, <laughs> it is. Check it out. Again, one is covered, two. Great, great move. Check it down. Oh, this is just a check down. Check down on the RPO, all right? And then you get runners and running or receivers 
that will go ahead and break tackles and get that extra yardage. I'll keep it moving here for you. Look at the offense line. These are now the backups from last year, at least a couple. The tackles are not quite them right there. Those are two backups. Because when you see 74, you'll see it. All right. So this is why Rutgers still struggles, okay? I have a high respect. So go ahead and look over here. Okay, now you're defending here. You got six in the box. You got two down here to these receivers. Great. Penn State's really spreading out. Look where these are right here now. They're really spreading it out here. And you have one that's up top here, and he's, you know, in the face. But here, he's 10 yards back. There's nobody in this space right here, 10 yards. All right? This is why Rutgers still struggles, because I can't figure it out. All right, RPO, run pass option. Well, what happens? You got six in the box. Well, I'm just going to go ahead. And, uh, this is what I see. Do you, you see that, folks? Do you see this base? Look at this guy. Is he trying to double down? I, I have. Why would you do this? This is not fundamentally sound. Look at the defensive end. He's still looking at the back. He's not even pulling. I mean, what what's going on? All right. But here, this is RPO. So they'll pull it. And I, I tell you what, probably not pull like this with uh, a liar. But I bet you they're going to pull it one or two times just to keep the defense honest. But again, he's watching this, but he sees the hole. And that's what they're taught. And that's why I'm showing this, is that if you're going to show a hole that big, I mean, he probably could have thrown the screen uh, and still been gotten five yards because the defender's back there, 10, 12 yards, man. <laughs> you know, that's a big hole over there. Uh, and, that, and that's what RPO is, run pass option to take advantage of a weakness in the defense. Okay, that's what it's about. And there's no doubt. We're going to get into more of this on Saturday for the pregame. Look at that, man. It's so cool. You got the pregame here. Look at this. You got doubles here. All right. You got, all right. Excuse me. You got empty. All right. You got trips to the field because you got the tight end and a one-by-one. He's an H back now, tight end, whatever you want to call it. But he's a one by one off the left tackle. You got two into the boundary, right? So you got empty backfield. Oh, uh, what is it? You know what it is? Spread it out, and we're going to run with a quarterback guard H counter. Oh, there you go. Look at it. It's pretty, man. It's a pretty play. You got to admit. You know, so you're being smart, all right, with your formations. You're getting spread out. But look at this. So they actually have four. As six in the box, right? And you're looking here at this guy, right? Let's say this guy here. He's not going to be anywhere over here. I mean, if he's going to go, he's going to make a tackle five, six yards downfield. So you can't really think that he's on the edge of the box. He's not in the box. He's straddling the box, right? So again, is look at this. Boom, boom. There you go. And uh, that's that's just good football. That's that's working the numbers. And what Penn State does really, really good is they get a defense, they see what you're doing, and they'll light it up. You just saw that, okay? It was empty backfield, but they did trips to the tight end left side. So they look at the straight to the left, and what do they do? They bring two blockers to the right. So they add it. So everybody comes down, okay, block down blocks, and then they're bringing two. You're adding numbers to the weak side where you're weak because that's what they call weak. That's what they do a lot of times, so they make – the numbers. And then you add the quarterback in there, which adds to the number. And that's what makes it so darn good football. And that's why you have to be precise and understand how to defend that and know what they can do and what they like to do. So you're knowing what they like to do, go ahead and check this out. So you have three dudes that are on the side of the center. You got the center, guard, and tackle. They're on the right side. Okay? You have three defenders. You're going to see a 38. I think it's 23. Who's that? Obviously, like a nickelback, and and uh, sixty eight or whatever the, the three technique over the right guard. Now you're bringing two, all right, the left guard and the H back. Watch, watch. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't see or forgot that I put that in or let that play run. There you go. Now watch. Look at that. You see, they're pulling. Everybody's down blocking, man. It's it's just it's pin and pull and. and they're coming through, and the numbers are good. It, that's great football. Look at this. You got no chance. Boom. It's Rutgers. All right. <laughs> I 
I kind of like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't see that before. All right, so they're showing the diamond formation back though. You got so you got three and then one by one. And <laughs> I didn't see that. Okay. Oh, what did I do? Uh, well, here we go. We'll keep moving on here. All right. So you're seeing this now. All right. What you gonna do? Is you gonna throw the ball? Or is you gonna get hand the ball off? Oh. Oh, I put it back to zero. That's what I did. No wonder why. All right, we just went there. All right, very good. All right. <laughs> okay, here you go. Look at this. This is a new play. Here you go. Here's the diamond. All right. Are they going to shift? All right, coming right on. Check it out. Look at, oh, it's a beautiful RPO pass. Look at this. Now, numbers, numbers. Look at that box, man. They've got tight, so you got four and six. So you already got six here, and now... You got the two players trying to straddle the box, straddle it. What do you have back here? Look at back. Look by the referee here. All right, this guy's here. He's seeing, seeing. All oh, it is going to be what a skinny post. Okay, look at the space. Look at the numbers on the inside, and then look at over here, man. It's, it's wide open. So this is a great look here. You, you got the diamond. Oh, that's easy money. Easy. All you have is a safety over there. That's easy, easy money. And you know what's nice about that is do that West Virginia Gary Green that he's good at that. So if you see that and he gets that kind of open for Gary Green is you can rest assured he's going to go ahead and, and jump on it. Look at the look at the back up back up there you go there you go very nice RPO run pass offense mm -hmm. backside. And, but that's what the, the defense, so if the defense is going to commit like that, and they're going to have to commit to some degree to go ahead and shut down the run. So they got to commit numbers, right? Well, then as DBs, watch this in the game. As DBs, you can't be backed off 10, 20, or 12 yards. You can't be. You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to be physical. Maybe even reroute some. Oh, crazy thoughts here. Maybe even reroute or play physical and throw them off the rhythm, the quarterback to the receiver, the route. You know, it's a timing thing. And that's what you want to do. Now, look at this. Uh, I'm seeing three here, and I'm seeing two defenders, right? Oh, this is that. I, you want to go ahead and defend this? Oh, come on, man. This is like, this is like taking candy from what? A baby, right? Go ahead. Rock and roll. Check this out. Uh, it's it's just numbers. That's three on two. Look at the closest defender. They're ten yards away. You got to get positive yards regardless. I mean, I, give me that. I'll, I'll take that every single time. Go ahead. Sit. There you go. Look, two blockers on two defenders. Third guy with a ball that was already out there. All he did was extend out five six yards. Look at the two defenders. If West Virginia cannot do this, you cannot do, do West Virginia. Do not be a Rutgers. Do not. I mean, I'm showing this to you. It's right there. It's obvious. It's three on two. You defend this. How many times did WVU not get lined up with Coach Brown? Neil said, we got, we're aligning this year. We're aligning, which is good news, right? Because he knows that was an issue, but how many times did they went quads to the Oklahoma State quads, Oklahoma quads to the boundary, or trips into the boundary, and you got two defenders, and you think you're gonna get a guy covered? It's kind of like you know straddling the box. Are you in the box or are you outside of the box? Well, you can't do both straddling. Either you're in or you're out. Walking down the middle of the lane ain't gonna work. Did I say hate? Yeah, I did. All right, sorry. Uh, okay. Keep going here. Look at this. It's numbers. Not going to get there. Two good blocks. There's an alleyway. Makes makes money. Make, makes it money. All right. Easy, man. This is just easy stuff. Uh, that's that's almost what, what Spavital used to call garbage yards. He just said, take the freebies. Take the freebies. Anyone that's free. If you see a guy that's backed off 10 yards and you can do a five-yard hitch, take, take the garbage. Gary Jennings did it all the time with Will Greer. You don't remember that. Even Sills to some degree. 
But Gary Jennings lived off of garbage yards, meaning is a, a dude was eight to ten yards back. Gary would stop at five and just do a hitch, and then Gary was strong enough to turn around, get one or two, maybe five more yards. Uh, lived up. Jay Spavitol caught it garbage. Okay, now you got three on three. Do you see this here? Now they got numbers out there. See, look what happens. You got numbers here. What are they going to do? Oh, but they go the other way. They go the other way because now you got numbers. So it's a game of chess. And it's a game of four going this way. We did this to you. But now we're going this way. Oh, run pass option, man. You got to love it. Now, look at these backs go here. Oh, uh, yeah. And let's see. All right, so this is Singleton Raider. Again, look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. We'll look at this at the end zone. Look at him run around. 1,061 yards. <laughs> right here. Look at this. Look at here. You got the guard in center. Oh, was that the center and the backside guard pulling? Okay. It's one, two. You're outnumbering him. Look at this. He's coming up for the backer. Look at the outnumber. And then what? Anyone wants to take a chance, if you have one-on-one -on -one in the open field, if you're offense, if you have one-on-one -on -one in the open field, any coach is going to say, I'll take that opportunity. I'll take that chance because my running back should be able to avoid a defender in open field one-on-one, -on -one, just like right here. And he gets big yards. Watch this now. Oh, watch this. All right, so you see here, pulling. It's actually, it is the center. Or no, I don't. That was actually the front side guard and the back side guard pulling. So you're going at, you're loading up everybody there to the left side. And you're coming back right and you're outnumbering them. Uh, all right. That's what Jordan Leslie's got to worry about that they're going to go ahead and try to outnumber you to the weak. To the weak. To the weak. You have three right here. Look at this. Number eight, the linebacker is probably what I call a 10 technique, a shade on the center right there. So there's three guys that are in the box to this side here. Not only do they have three guys that are with the center, but they're pulling. All right, they're pulling. Uh -huh. mm, look at that. Red Carter back. Oh, that's pretty. Pretty, pretty, pretty. And look at those, those linemen. They can run. They could be in the open field. That's a nice job there, 6-4. Nice job. Okay, what do we got here now? We still got numbers. See, look at this. Now you got four on three out here. You see that? Four on three. And then you have, really, five right in the inside box. What are they going to do? Hmm. They're going to run, baby. Run right there. And they would have actually been a lot better if they would have ran right up the middle. Right up the middle. There you go. Watch this. Watch it. Okay, so they're pulling again. Well, look at the numbers. They keep doing this. They start off. And then they pulled their offensive linemen. So they're outflanking you in numbers. It's kind of like the military, man. It's, it's about numbers right there. And you like the attack point. And actually, that defender did a nice job there on the one blocker. And that's the reason why he struggled for 10 yards. It wasn't so clean. It wasn't so clean. And well, I just said 64 did a great job in the last play. Did a bad job on that play. But they still got there because the numbers are clean. They're clean. Watch it. Right there. Look at this. They're all, it's, it's just pin and pull. Pin and pull. There's, there's nothing hard about that. It's just numbers. And bring them. So you got to get out flanked. You have to watch it because of the weak side. So what I'm trying to get at is that they're, they're showing strength to one side and they're running back to the weak side and they're pulling two players, whether it be two offensive linemen, whether it be an H, a tight end and an H spot and an offensive lineman. It doesn't matter. They're going to get two guys that are going to come back weak side and block, and they outnumber the defense that way because you're trying to align to the strength. And when you go ahead and you put four over three, like they did in that one, onto the receivers, you only have so many over here. You only have seven left. Let's see. Let's watch. Okay, a couple more here. I don't want to kill you to death here, but man, this is good. This is really good football. J. Juan Slater, brother. Brother Mountaineer is co-offensive coordinator. I'm sure your shit is the one that, that calls the plays and, and works it. But Jay Wan Sutter is heavily involved in this offense. I'm uh, really proud of him and watching this. I, you know, I was on staff with him at WVU. He's, he's been at Marshall. He's been in Florida. 
He's gone on to do some great things, but I'm, I'm proud of this. This is a good offense. It's a very good offense. And they, they, they do a lot of stuff to outnumber him, and then they go ahead and they put right there. It was that K. Trot Allen right there, 13. Yeah, right there. Uh, I got it right. Yep, 13. That's K. Trot Allen. That's the number two back that had 800, 861 yards. So you can watch it again. All right, so what are they seeing here? You're seeing three over two outside. You know, there's six in the box. One's going to come here and walk down. Okay. And he's still going to, you know what? This is a perfect example of you still got to be able to run the ball. Even when numbers don't go your way. And when numbers don't go your way, you still have to run the ball. And this is what they do. And they just put a good running back behind it. But let's go ahead and take a look. Again, this guy coming from the outside, not a big deal because it's inside zone. And it's hard for them to get in there the way things rock and roll. Okay, so you have one backer that's up. And here's the problem that you're seeing. That it's called gap integrity. They're not filling the gaps in the middle. They're not. And we'll see it from the end zone show it. All right, here we go. So you got two linebackers. Okay, you got the 10 here. So remember when I told you West Virginia last year, they lined up and there's nobody in the bubble here? Well, he's in the bubble, so that, that that's good right here. He's in the bubble, and he's in the bubble here, right? So we go ahead and we move this out. So what, what happens here to this defense that what he sees? He sees three over two. I think he might even see the blitz. So he's coming in. He sees the blizzard. Maybe that's what he saw, and he's going to go inside zone. So let's take a look here in the end zone shot. All right. So now, all right. Well, now you see it. Okay. <laughs> it's not hard. What's he doing here? 27. What are you doing here? 27. You have outside contain here at 21. Outside contain, right? Yeah. The, this guy here is going inside the tackle, and this guy here is playing the, the B gap. He's got to be playing over here. You got to be here or here. So, I mean, these guys are covering the 13. He's taking the B gap. He's all right. It's 27. Gap integrity. You don't get all your gaps. Slow and late. And then you get eaten up. Eaten up. Eaten up. All right. There you go. I keep, you know, I should stop here. All right. Going around. I'll just look at these guys. I'm going to break down these guys, but I'll show you how they run. I want to show you this offensive line. I got to show you uh, Bolanu or whatever you uh, Jay Paterno called him. Uh, what a good Jay Paterno, what a good dude, huh? I love being on the pigskin stew with him right there. You I love doing that with Tom Bradley being on there because boy, I tell you, they know football. I don't care. Coaches, you got to respect them, they put it in their time. And you can see here, all right, folks, I'm gonna call quit 148 into it. All right, here we go. So let's go ahead and break it down, get this going over here and this is all let's go ahead and pull up and i gotta do it i'm gonna do it every time well not every time but a lot of times that it's a uh, network now tomorrow let's go ahead and talk about this oh uh, when we go ahead we put this up here and tomorrow again is cover two data coming in cover two data is coming in and it's money ball we're going to break it down. Analytics. Got Tony Altimore talking Pac-12. Talking what's going on in college football. Probably one of the, the smartest guys that I see out there. No, way smarter than moi when it comes to like conference realignment. Knowledge about the Pac-12. I mean, dude, he can go back. I think he's got like a photographic memory, all right? Uh, I'm not afraid to, to know my strengths and know my weaknesses as well. All right, no, in fact, knowing my strengths and knowing my weaknesses, let me go ahead here. Uh, Cantrell's River City Grill. I'm going to go from right to left instead of left to right. Uh, grill and Pub, right there in Hinton, West Virginia, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. The special is buy a pint. Next pint's on them. Just for the Wolfman's Call pregame special at the Pallet Bar. Then you have Calcino's Pizzeria and Sports Bar down in Beckley, West Virginia. And it's a week's family. And then you look at Route Sports 22. They're worked in West Virginia. Man, I, they got the bottoms up there, the draft system. And they got the 12 50-inch screen TVs. 12 of them together. Then you have Archie's there at East Carson Street. 
in the heart of the evil empire in Pittsburgh. A legend's there in Gizzy. Uh, you have uh, right out there in Lakeview, Cheat Lake, Legend Sports Bar and Grill. Gizzy, what's up, brother? Danny's down there in Princeton. Paige, shout out to you. Danny's. Yep. Kegler Sports Bar, Morgantown. Jerry, man. Greg, Steve. You know, Dougie. The Reds family. Royalty. Go bowling, too, man. They do a lot of bowling there at the bowling alleys. And it's uh, suburban lanes. I mean, go, you can go bowling there. You get the you get the Wolfman burger. Oh, best burger in town. Just because it says Wolfman. All right. Mason Jar Saloon. Hot spot right out there past the Morgantown Mall in uh, Morgantown. And then you have Jimbo's place. So nice. They had to do it twice. That's right. One in Elkins, Jimbo's place, and one in Buchanan. Jimmy Pointer, what's up, Jimmy? You have the Pout, as we all know. I'm going down there doing the pregame special in-house on, on this network and the Voice of College Football Network. And then we go to, to the Mountaineer Tap House. Mel, what's up? Hey, you got right there Country Roads. You got a, oh, a pregame going there. So all you students doing pregame, Country Roads and the Trust and with uh, the Mountaineer Tap House. Get down there, man. It's going to be good. A good place to watch the game. Then you got in Fairmont, West Virginia, Steve Reese, Mason's Yard, Barbecue, and more. Unbutton those britches because when you go there eating that barbecue, whoo, that's good stuff. And then you go ahead. You got Chef Paul down at the Pitch Smart uh, Sports Bar and Grill. Chef Paul, Pitch in Dunbar, West Virginia. And last but not least, certainly not in your hearts, guys. He's number one, Rob Davis, right there. Rob down in. Uh, uh, Bridgeport, West Virginia, and it's Brickside Bar and Grill. He has 30 drafts, different kinds of drafts. He has, uh, golly, it's called Eat Loco, man, because he's got the good food, and he's a good dude. All right, so that's that. Nobody wanted to come on. Nobody wants to get on there and say, hey, you know what, Wolf, I want to break this stuff down with you, man. Come on, break it down. Because y'all get there on Twitter, man, and on Twitter, y'all want to fight me and uh, what everything I say. Well, come on. It's okay. You don't have to fight. We can do it courteously, man. We can do it responsibly. All you got to do is just come on. Just come on. It, it, it's okay. I will treat you with respect, right? Let's see. Timothy, what are you going to do, man? Going to be tuning in for tomorrow's show. You know why? Cover to data, baby. I'm, try, I'm trying to get Big Johnny Ray, the largest mountaineer ever, to come on and talk mountaineer football. Big John. John, I know you're out there. I know you're out there. We want you to come on. Quit hiding from me. You're six foot nine. You're four hundred and fifty pounds. You can't hide. All right. <laughs> what about this? Oh, I'll tell you what. What is this? We need to show great toughness. All right. That's cool, man. Mike Rollins. I said I talked to you about this, right? I still believe that speed kills. Mike, you are a hundred percent right. Speed kills. You know what it kills? It kills fast. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. All right. Very good, man. And hey, what do we got here? Very lucky. Yeah, Wolfie Brothers playing at WVU. Thanks for the memories. Well, I thank all of you for the memories because I love WVU. Been around since 1981. Since brother Ronnie Paul came down from Orchard Park, New York. Came down and made that down I-90 in New York. Then we hit I-79 up way back 40 years ago. And been here coming ever since. And Brother Craig went down there to Pittsburgh. And big fans for even at Syracuse. All right, everybody. Not coming on. So, listen, I want you to have a great day. Let's get a little bit here of Zach Frazier. Let's not forget about the Palabar Saturday. I keep saying it, but I keep wanting to tell you. They had Voice of College Football on YouTube. Go ahead. Sign up on the network. Sign up. Like it. Smash the buttons. Like it all. Whatever you got to do. And then, of course, uh, I, I want you to be able to watch it at one of these fine establishments. And if your establishment is not too late, if you want to jump on and you want to get it at your place, the Wolfman's Call I'm talking about, just email me at wolfmanscall at gmail.com. Wolfmanscall at gmail.com. Pretty easy, right? All right. Well, all right, everybody. You have a great day tomorrow, 4 o'clock. We will see you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Paterno. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, folks. And thank you for joining us.
Hi, I'm Zach Frazier from Fairmont. When I'm back home, you'll find me at my local Parmar store. We had that gold and blue pride at your local Parmar store. We are coming to your neighborhood soon. West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, we have you covered. Download the Parmar app and sign up for the Parmar Rewards Card. Food, gas, groceries, and more, we are Gold and Blue Proud, and we are Parmar Stores. If there's not a Parmar store near you now, there will be soon. Northern Eagle Distributing, proudly serving Anheuser-Busch products to West Virginia. Stationers, number one office supplier in West Virginia, always in stock. All many, the anywhere, anytime chargers, powering a connected world. Never buy AA batteries again. Rechargeable 500 times plus. Call many AA USB lithium battery as easy to charge as your cell phone. Sustainable energy, stay charged. Go green, save green. Feel the power of Paul. Order now at paulmini.com. West Virginia United.